Hey everyone, hope you're doing well. We have a beautiful summer day here, actually late spring. And I'm gonna do this old barn. It's a white barn, it has a really interesting shadow that goes across it in uh, mid-late afternoon. It's still kind of early afternoon here. Right now I'm using some cool paint to block in a composition. Friend of mine just drove by. Usually, when I go out and paint, I don't know anybody out there, but this uh, friend of mine who's actually an art teacher, um, he lives fairly close to here. Last week after I was painting, I stopped at his house and he gave me some wonderful, a whole series of books um, on Native Americans. I do my main artwork that I usually do is historical Native American. And so that was a really neat thing to be able to get those books. <clears throat> I used to do uh, mainly landscape and wildlife but um, I switched a few years ago to Native American for the most part. I still do this though for practice. It's always good to keep plein air painting because my subject matter, my historical Native American subject matter does have a lot of landscape in it. And granted it's, um, right now I'm in the east and it's more western, but I get out west. Um, at least once a year and spend a couple weeks plein air painting and photographing like crazy. Last September went out to uh, Wyoming and I actually have some paintings from that trip on my channel. But went out there and spent um, I think about 10 days and I did about 37 plein air studies in those 10 days, I was just painting nonstop from sunup to sundown. And by the way, if you're new to my channel, if you haven't, or if you've been watching for a while and you haven't done so, if you could subscribe, that would be awesome. Helps uh, support me to keep doing this and encourages me I'm going to try to put out a video about once a week. Don't know if I'll make it, but I'm going to definitely try. So I um, blocked this in, and you're probably wondering why I used a blue instead of like a warm earth tone. A lot of artists will use a warm earth tone when they do this, but um, I used a blue because overall this painting is cool. When I look at it, when I look at the, um, the scene, you, know, you have blue sky here, you have a white barn, very cool shadows going on, and then you have this uh, green grass. It's a uh, slightly warm green, but it's not an earthy green. So there's not much in the way of earth tones going on in here. And because I'm painting wet on wet, if I had put, down, put this down with a warm tone, which I could have, but it would have, that warm tone could have got into my cool tones and made them a bit uh, muddy. So um, decided not to do that. Now there is a silo, a big one over here. I'm just leaving it out because 
it's too close to the edge and I don't think it's going to add anything anyway. Now, as I look at my scene, I have to figure out my darkest darks and the trick with this scene is that there's not a lot of super dark things going on. Um, a lot of times when I paint the scene, I have a nice almost number 10 value to work off of, but that's not the case here. Everything is um, fairly illuminated. So it's going to make it a little more tricky because you're going to be starting off with a bit more ambiguity. But I do see a dark right in here. I'm going to get in. And also there are some windows right about here. Still a little too uh, dark, I think. These windows, they, they have, there's so much ambient light bouncing off the sunlit grass here that's illuminating these windows. And it's taken them from being a uh, intensely dark to, uh, to, to a bit lighter. It's not the most carefully drawn, but I'm not too worried about that right now. I can fix that later. I used to obsess over getting every single little shape perfect when I was out planar painting, and you don't need to do that. You just need to uh, make a note and then move on to something else. You don't have time when you're out here to do absolute perfection in drawing, and there's no need to. One of these days when I get the time and the courage, I'm going to record myself for you guys doing a uh, low light scene with the lights changing really fast. Those are always very challenging. And depending on what it is on a scene like that, I might just throw drawing completely out the window. Okay, so this scene, it's really about ambiguity. Um, there's so much light bouncing around in here that for me, there is nothing real solid to grab onto confidently from a uh, value perspective. This makes it really tricky. I'm actually being kind of blinded by my solvent can. I might have to move it. The sun keeps reflecting off the uh, mineral spirits in the can and bouncing back up right into my eye. So there's this shadow right here which is fairly dark. It's probably the darkest shadow in the whole thing as far as a bigger cast shadow and this is going to extend further this way as I keep painting and I might chase it to a certain degree and also there's a shadow here that'll be blocking in soon that's going to extend quite a bit too I think though before I go too much further I'm going to block in some of this foreground green by the way, I didn't tell you my colors yet. Titanium white, cadmium lemon, cadmium yellow light, cadmium orange, yellow ochre, transparent red oxide, um, alizarin crimson, ultramarine blue, cobalt blue, viridian, and chromium green oxide. A lot of times I have cerulean on my palette too. I just don't have it on yet. I'm not sure if it'll make it or not. I might put it on because there is a lot of blue going on here in this scene. I 
I'm the type of artist, I like to start with the most obvious and then work my way into ambiguity. And this green here that I'm putting in is a little more obvious on what it should be than the shadows of this barn are. That's enough to get me started. Um, I'm not going to obsess over finishing a, this uh, dark area yet, or not this dark area, I'm sorry, but this green area, because that's probably going to change the least in this scene. What's gonna change the fastest are these shadows on this barn. They've already changed quite a bit from when I first started. And the shapes of these shadows is what really has drawn me into this. Okay, so right under here, this actually gets kind of a dark green and slightly warm. And that's because these, uh, these roofs will protrude out a little bit from the wall and the underside of them will pick up all this ambient warm green light from the sun coming up into there, bouncing, the sun bouncing off this grass, and it'll bounce up into there, and it'll capture that and give this dark area like kind of this greenish tone, because it's just the grass bouncing off there. And sometimes it can get even a little bit intense if you're really looking there. Also seeing it with this structure here. Now I know this structure is a little taller than what it is in life. Once again, I'm not concerned about absolute precise drawing here. If I were doing a plein air event, maybe, but even then, you know, it's just, it just doesn't have to be drawn perfectly. I remember one time being in the Grand Teton Mountains and it was getting toward evening. This is when I was out there last September and I saw this guy out plinter painting and he had just started and he was painting so carefully. I think he was actually drawing in with a pencil the shapes of the mountains. He's trying to get every single little crevice and peak in there perfect. And he hadn't even really picked up a brush yet. Now, maybe he was going to go back the next day, but I was just sick of man. You're never going to get that done in time. You know, just save the precise drawing for back in the studio. Some low light scenes when I'm painting them, I will just, um, I'll just grab my palette knife and I'll just throw down random shapes. Um, just general suggestions of sky and ground and trees or whatever else. I don't even try to get them anything precise. I'm really just after notes of color and value. And of course, I'll snap a photo or two. And then back in the studio, I can take those color and value notes and use those along with the photograph to come up with a uh, convincing painting.
Okay, so next thing I want to do is I want to get this shadow in. This thing is just creeping along very steadily. And the color is going to be a bit ambiguous. Um, I know I'm going to have to go back and forth. until I get it somewhat right. Same with the value. But you gotta start somewhere. I'm gonna keep it thin. down too far with that. That's actually where the stone part of the barn begins. Actually, the white was covered up a little too much of that. So I'm really trying to analyze this and get it precise. There's a little bit of um, sunlight still hitting this. Most of it's in shadow. I'm going to see if I can get that locked in before the whole thing changes too much. Architecture is very tricky. On a day like this, I'm doing. I'm dealing with side lighting, back lighting, or front lighting is a lot easier to deal with. But side lighting, the shadows shift so fast, and you just got to be constantly on the move. I'm going to block in some of the front or the sunlit part of the barn.
they seem a bit counterproductive, but I'm going to switch to a smaller brush. It's because uh, it gives me a little more control. And I know this is probably looking a little different than the reference photo. It's just the lights moving so fast and changing this so much. And I don't have time to stop the video, take the camera off the tripod, shoot another reference photo, put it back on, get it all going again. It's just moving too quick, so you're going to have to use your imagination. When I get really quiet like this, it's because I'm feel I'm really up against a gun, so I don't talk a whole lot, which you might enjoy anyway. So I'm sure there's probably times during my videos where people are saying, "Just shut up and paint," and I can't blame you. This is a marathon run though, let me tell you. So when you're doing these uh, quickly changing shadows on architecture, you really just have to, you know, 
determine where the light's going to change the fastest and get that in. And once you get it in, kind of leave it alone at that point. I'm not going to chase these shadows around anymore after I get them in there, unless I see something that would just really make for a better painting and I can sneak it in but I'm not going to obsessively chase them. Like, oh my goodness, now it's like this, now I gotta do it like that. No, it's like this. You don't, you don't wanna go in with the attitude that what you had down before was incorrect. Cause it's probably not the case, it's just the scene changed, so. See, so you have to have some confidence. And as I said before in my other videos, your main objective is just get the relationships in. Don't worry about anything else. And if you're newer to planner painting, I would recommend starting off with subjects that are not quite so challenging. This is tough, and I've been planner painting for many years, and I still approach these with a bit of uh, fear, if you will. And notice how I haven't done the sky yet. The sky's not gonna change back here much at all. So, not worried about the sky. Doing this is nerve-wracking enough, but then doing it and showing it to the world on YouTube is a whole other ball game. I used to be a musician though, so I don't want to say this is performing, but you have to uh, be willing to you know, expose what you're doing to many people. And so I kind of little happy for my music background. Being on a stage is quite a bit different than this, but it's uh, there are some similarities to it. Oh, we got a cloud coming over. That was another thing. When I did this, I wanted to make sure I did it on a mostly sunny day. I was actually going to wait till tomorrow. They're saying it's going to be perfectly clear tomorrow. But um, it looked really nice out here today, so I thought I'd give it a shot. I usually try to do everything a la prima. Um, a la prima is done all in one session. It's it's rare, but sometimes I do 
go back to a scene for a second time around. I've not done it for any of my YouTube videos yet, but I won't say it'll never happen. It, it may happen. The problem with painting um, scenes that have complex uh, shadow play going on and all that is because if you get a big cloud that goes over your scene and covers it up for a long time, by the time that cloud goes away, the sun will be moved even more and your shadows will be shifted even more. So if you do decide to do a scene like this, um, hope and pray for a high pressure day. And when uh, clouds do cover up the scene like this, I tend to stop focusing on color and value, and then I focus more on, I try to focus more on drawing and cleaning things up. So like this window here, you know, is a little, it's pretty rough. Um, so I, I, I'm not gonna bother fixing that until either I'm done or I have a situation like this where the clouds come over my seam. Cloud shadows are one of my biggest frustrations when I'm out painting. Or if the scene just changes altogether. There's been times where I've been painting and I swear it's like God just sticks a cloud right over me after I start and just kind of leaves it there for about 45 minutes or something. And sometimes you just have to give up and go home. So it's kind of like, all right, I guess you don't want me painting this today. And this cloud's hanging around a long time. You can also uh, try to paint from memory too. But when you're doing something as um, ambiguous and subtle as this, painting from memory is tricky. Another good thing to do when there's a cloud over you like this is clean your palette, which is what I think I'm gonna do right now. Okay, palette's cleaned off, and I think we're about to get our sun back. This cloud is moving very, very slow. But I see it's coming back over my scene. Almost there. And we are good. There are some more clouds that might be moving in, but I think we have some time yet. Yeah. 
and see all this light that I have here in the barn is pretty much completely gone now. It's covered up by pretty much all in shadow. So it's a good thing I got it in there when I did. love that red-winged blackbird. Not sure if you can hear that, but it's one of my favorite sounds. Growing up in uh, rural Minnesota on the lakes and wetlands, I used to hear that all summer. Didn't appreciate it as much when I was a kid, but I do now. Where I live now, they only hang around for a little while, early summer, and then they're gone. They go further north. Trying to uh, get a little more accurate impression here. Looks like we might have company. I'm just going to keep painting. Got a dog anyway. Got a little too cool purple in there. So I wanted to uh, change that up a bit. I think I'm going to go with some viridium.
there was such a, there was this door right here, um, and then this stone or cinder block around it, and the light. It's such a subtle difference between the door and the uh, and the block. I'm just trying to get that subtlety in there, but this whole thing is in shadow now, pretty much. So there's only so much I can do with that. Looks like the uh, company is not coming. Looks like they're going back to their house. Probably just curious to see what I was doing. Okay, next thing I want to get in is a silo right here. And there's this building back here also. It's pretty much all in shadow. And it was in shadow since I came, so not a big deal. But silos next let's get in that's pretty intense and a little too yellow I'm gonna mix some white with a little bit of alizarin to tone the yellow down a bit See the drawing on that's pretty pretty lacking. I'm gonna have to fix that up a bit. obsess over drawing when I'm planner painting, but I definitely don't want, want it to look ridiculous. Had a bumblebee creeping around. Guess he thought I was maybe in his area. I don't know. By the way, um, if you're interested, I teach online painting classes. Um, I have a, a membership site. We can sign up and uh, you can join us. Um, most every Saturday we spend four weeks doing a painting from start to finish and we paint a lot slower than this for obvious reasons. I also demo the painting on my own and record it so you can watch me painting um, by myself because painting by yourself and teaching are uh, kind of two different things and so I try to give it the best of both worlds. But like I said, we meet every Saturday, almost every Saturday, depending on how many Saturdays are in that month. And we spend four weeks doing a painting. All the sessions are recorded. So if you miss a session, you can't make it, um, or you want to just watch it later and pick up on the stuff you didn't get, um, they're available. We also have a uh, live Q&A session. We can ask me anything you want, art related that is, and a um, live uh, critique session where you can send me any paintings, drawings you've been doing and get feedback on them. And what's great is when you sign up, um, we usually we take new members at the end of the month to start for the following month. So the doors only open 
toward the end of the month and there's limited space. Um, that way you're not coming in in the middle of the month. But um, as soon as you do join, you get access to uh, recordings of all sessions going back to this February. I'll just shut up and wait for the plane to get <laughs> go over. So you're probably not hearing a darn word I'm saying when that plane flies over. Those things are loud. But anyway, as I was saying, you get, um, as soon as you become a member on the site, um, you get access to the recordings of all past sessions going back to this February. And so you, you can watch those and you can do those paintings too. And you, as long as you stay a member, you'll continue to have access to those and to the recordings of the sessions that you are part of. Um, if you are interested, click on the link in the description below and that'll take you to the uh, priority list where you can sign up. Let's put your uh, name and email in there. If you put your name in there, that'd be awesome too. I get some people just put an email in and when I reach out to them, I just gotta go, hey, instead of, you know, hey Jim or something like that. It's up to you if you don't want to put your name in, that's fine. But. But anyway, um, love to have you there. It's a cool group. A lot of people have been with me since the beginning. So sign up and I'll let you know when the spot's open. So this is a really interesting study here on the silo um, and how shadows work. As it starts to get toward the core of the shadow, that's uh, core, C-O-R-E. Um, my, my pronunciation on that is not always spectacular. It's my Minnesota accent trying to blend with the, my current accent that I picked up from the east that uh, trips me up. But anyway, it's the core of the shadow. And the core of the shadow is the area of the shadow that's not picking up any of the sunlight or the cool uh, blue skylight coming this way and it's usually the darkest part of the shadow and as it gets toward the core of the shadow um, the light starts to get a little bit warmer now what I'm painting right now is the core and you can see how that's dark and see how that really getting that subtle dark you don't want to get too dark with it but getting that subtle dark in there really emphasizes the roundness of this silo And now I'm going to do is grab some titanium white, which I'm almost out of. I'm going to have to replenish here in a second. And I'm going to warm that up with uh, yellow ochre. And I put a touch of alizarin in there. And I'm almost seeing a little bit of green in this, too. Probably from those grasses. But right about here, it starts to warm up. The sunlit site gets a little darker and a little warmer right before it gets into that core area. In fact, it almost looks like it gets a little more magenta-ish as I go up, which makes sense because it's going to stop picking up this um, green here and it's going to start picking up more of the cool colors of the sky. And I could really obsess over this all day, but I have to stop and just kind of let it be. As the Beatles once said. I think it's Paul McCartney who sang that one. Can't remember for sure, but it's gotta be some Beatles fan out there who can comment in, in the section below and tell us. Okay, 
Okay, now I gotta replenish my titanium white here. Okay, titanium white is replenished. I'd like to get in the uh, top of the rest of the top of this uh, old silo. We're gonna hear a tractor here. Uh, mid-May getting toward late May um, when this is being recorded so the farmers are busy out planting it's been a very cold spring kind of wet too so I'm sure they're anxious to get out and get some work done Got this thing hanging off here. I'm gonna have to fix that later when I block in the sky. So uh, topic of this video is essentially painting quickly changing light on architecture and just want to review a little bit of what I had suggested. The big thing is identify what's going to change first, um, what's going to change the quickest. Now if you're brand new to planar painting that might be a little harder to do and if you're brand new to planar painting I wouldn't even advise doing something like this you're probably just going to frustrate yourself and give up um, if you're new to planar painting choose easier subjects and I'm gonna have to stop talking here for a minute because the tractor is coming right by us Oh, now he's kicking up <laughs> whatever the vegetation is that he's uh, chopping up. It's starting to float all over my painting. Oh my goodness. The perils of plein air. <laughs> when I lived in Minnesota, I would, uh, there's a lot of dirt roads up there that I really miss. I love dirt roads because you could just park pretty much anywhere uh, legally and uh, and paint and um but i remember people would go by and they would uh some people would just speed right by like you weren't even there and kick up dust all over your painting i was doing watercolor mostly back then and it was just a disaster in watercolor not the greatest for oil either but anyway back to what i was saying um First thing you want to do is, if you are going to attempt it, is identify what's going to change the most. And usually what's going to change the most are going to be cast shadows. 
And what we mean by cast shadows is those are shadows on a sunny day that um, that are being cast by an object such as you know a silo or something like that. So identify your your cast shadows, what's going to change, and go for those first. Get get enough blocked in to uh, of something that you are um, comfortable with to be able to uh, work those cast shadows off of, paint something obvious, get it blocked in. Don't perfect it though. Don't sit there and try to do all this perfect drawing. Just get those big shapes in there and uh, get them blocked in. You can make them pretty later. You can, you know, fix all the little things like this and like that. You can fix all that later. Just get the shadows in first. What's going to change? The thing that's going to change the least is going to usually be your ground. If you have a cast shadow on the ground, that's going to change quickly. We don't have that situation really here. And the sky, you know, save the sky for last. That's not going anywhere. I mean, unless you have storm clouds move in or something like that. If that's the case, I wouldn't even bother doing it that day. I would save it for another day. But, um, now identify what's going to change first, get that blocked in, and then go for the other stuff. Go for, uh, you know, refinement and all that other jazz. And really, if you're newer to plein air painting, I recommend, because I did this a lot when I first started, is I highly recommend going out on overcast days and painting. The, it's not as exciting. I Actually, I used to love it. I was a big Richard Schmidt fan. And if you look at Richard Schmidt's work, um, notice that most of his paintings are done on overcast days. And I would recommend going out on overcast on overcast days because you have a lot more time to paint. It's a lot more forgiving. You don't have all these shifting cast shadows to deal with. And plus an overcast, basically in order to suggest um, the light side of an object, you really just need to add white. When you're dealing on a sun, when you're painting a sunny day in order to suggest sunlight, you have to use white because it's the light value, but then you have to uh, also add in you know, yellow and things like that. And you don't have those problems on an overcast day. So I cut my teeth on overcast and then eventually moved to, uh, to sunlight when I first started. So it's just a little trick. You don't, you, of course, you don't have to do it like that. If you love paintings in sunlight, then by all means, go for sunlight. But just realize that there are some challenges there that are not there on an overcast day. However, you don't want to, you know, if you want to do sunlight, you don't want to stay overcast forever. But you can if that's what you really like. Um, wildlife artist, one of the masters um, that I really like is a. Uh, He's a pretty real, he's a fairly realistic painter, is Robert Bateman. And if you look closely at his work, a lot of his stuff was overcast. He lives up in Canada, Western Canada, and I guess they have a lot of overcast days there, period. So it's probably just what he sees. But um, a lot of his stuff is overcast. Same with uh, Lars Johnson, a, um, another wildlife artist from, I think, from Sweden. And uh, he does a lot of overcast stuff and that's you know, arguably his best work. He does some incredible sunlight stuff too and so does Bateman but a lot of their stuff is overcast. Okay so now I want to get this in here. This shadow has not changed too much, not nearly as much as this, because this was catching, barely catching side light. 
I knew that was just going to change like fast. That this whole thing is in shatter now, um, in just this short amount of time I've been painting. I do want to fix the drawing on that. And I'll probably touch that up later. Might even do it in the studio. Alright, so for this, there's this door down here. Here comes the tractor again. Add a touch of mineral spirits. Okay, so this door, there's a door right there. It's in shadow. Now this is white. That's the local color that is. This is a uh, this is cinder block here and it's a darker color. Now, this is never gonna look right until I get this blocked in because I'm subconsciously comparing this to the white when this is a white door. So if you put something white in that's in shadow and you're painting it next to white, you gotta get all this covered up. You'll never be able to judge that correctly. It'll drive you absolutely insane. I've done that. I remember doing a quick draw one time. I was painting a white house and in, in mostly shadow. It was actually a scene a little, not too dissimilar from this, but it was in town. And um, it was at a plein air event. And about an hour into it, because I hadn't blocked in my darks, I thought the whole thing was gonna be a disaster. I was literally about ready to just scrape it and turp it and consider it a failure and go back to the judging area and just tell them, nope, I don't have a painting, sorry. And, um, but before I did that, I blocked in the dark windows and the whole thing just fell together just like that it made all the the white areas totally make sense and it saved the painting and then I actually ended up winning first place with it so and that's because I was trying to paint white over white without having the darks blocked in so get those darks in because You'll never, you'll never judge white objects, white local objects in your painting without darks in there. Unless you're super good. I mean, maybe you're really good, but if you're that good, you're not gonna be watching my videos. So, at least I wouldn't think you would, unless you're really bored or something like that. And if you are that good and you're watching my videos, thank you, that's cool. But. Okay, so wait till the tractor gets a little further behind us. All right, so at this door, there's some interesting subtle tonality going on. Um, it goes from dark to slightly lighter as it goes as it comes out from the uh, corner there, and maybe that's just some local color stuff happening. Maybe it's just dirtier the closer it gets, but I have a feeling it's just because it's picking up more light as it gets out further. Now another thing I have to get in is uh, block in the shadow a little bit more. Oh, and by the way, I don't know if I said this before, but if you could like this video too, if you do like it, that is, um, keep the algorithms happy. That would be great. The more likes it gets, the more YouTube keeps me from being relegated to the realms of deep space, outer space, where nobody finds me. And it's not a fun place to be, but.
Okay, so I got a little too light in there. I want to get a little darker again. It's no problem. Just grab some darker blue. I'm going to neutralize it a little bit with the touch of alizarin. It's not completely completely neutralizing it, but it is toning it down from the intensity of just pure ultramarine blue and a little bit of iridium. Now let's go in here. I'm chasing this shadow a little bit from what it is in the photograph, in the reference photo. So I know it's going to look a little different, but that's okay. I want to do that, so I'm going to do it. And actually, I want to bring this door out more. Just want to check, make sure I'm still recording here. My camera beeps at me when it shuts off. But with that tractor going by, I might not hear a beep. I hate it when it shuts off and I don't know it because then I just keep talking and painting and you guys aren't seeing it so I've done a couple videos where I've gotten back into my studio to edit them and I there was no sound or when I first got this new camera I went out and I did a whole video painting some rocks along this shoreline and uh, I had the camera on autofocus and it decided to focus on the rocks and the shoreline way further back from my painting and, and the whole painting and palette was uh, in a blur. So that one just got deleted. Might try to get back out to that spot sometime and paint it again. But um, that is very frustrating. My latest recording debacle was uh, on an overcast day and I had the painting tipped up a little too much and it was a bright overcast. It just caused this whole glare and it was kind of a dark painting and it just glared the whole thing out. You, you could still kind of make it out but it was very poor quality and I I just knew that you guys probably would not like that one, so I I was so tempted to try to keep it and make it work, but I just, no, I deleted it. I told my wife, I was like, there's no way I can put that out there. People will like it. And I'm soon going to be going out west again. Um, and I just hope everything goes well out there. I do plan on recording when I'm out there. I absolutely love going out west. Been researching some spots in the uh, in Montana to paint. Something that's uh, kind of secluded and beautiful, but yet yeah, still somewhat easy to get to. I was looking at one spot where I'd have to hike six miles one way and six miles back, doing that with a bunch of camera equipment. I, I literally was thinking, uh, seriously considering it, but I found a spot that is much easier to get to. I mean, it's literally like right off the park lot and it's incredibly beautiful. So I'm gonna do that instead because if I had a caddy or something to carry my equipment, I might do a 12 mile round trip hike, but I'm not that young anymore. Okay, now what I'm painting is a tin 
uh, roof here and it's a very light value and this is another thing too until I get the blue sky in I'm probably gonna need to make some adjustments to it however I know I'm very close I don't mind going a little bit thicker in with this because I know it's not going to be too difficult to adjust it. Obviously, I'm kind of a little, a little boo-boo there. Okay, so couple things I'm gonna have to bring this roof line down a little bit it's a little too high and got to fix sorry my camera shut off um, got to fix this roof line here this is a little too high and I got to fix this this thing the shape is all messed up the drawing but that's easy I, I could fix this at like 8.30 at night and get the drawing on that right when the light's completely different. That's not a big deal. But I said save the little, you know, try to get your drawing pretty good at the beginning, but all the little tiny corrections, save those for the end when you have this quickly changing light. Um, what's changing fast is the light, not the barn, not the drawing. Now I've painted animals in plein air that is kind of the ultimate challenge because the drawing does change on those as well as the light but um, this is not an animal so you don't have to worry about a big change in drawing so now I'm gonna grab my biggest brush this is a number six and we're gonna get the sky blocked in Starting with a bit of Viridian, believe it or not, with white. It's a little too green. Let's go a little more ultramarine here. Gonna thin it a bit. There are some clouds floating around, but not too many. I'm not going to worry about it because they're not why I'm out here. I did do a cloud painting video recently. Go to my channel. You can see that. And I'll probably do some more. I like painting clouds, but this is about architecture. I'm going to be very careful to keep this clean, to keep this paint away from the uh, dirty areas when I'm doing the initial block into these colors. And it looks like I'm going to have to replenish my titanium white again.
Now as the sky gets toward the horizon, it gets a little bit lighter, a little more uh, greener if you will. And as it gets really close to the horizon, it even starts to get slightly yellowish. A little ochre, a little um, magenta-ish color. Depending on the what's going on back there with the clouds and everything. I'm going to slightly indicate that. I'm even seeing those lighter, warmer colors in the sky here. A blue sky is not like a solid mass. You want to uh, break it up a bit. Generally what happens with the blue sky is that it gets uh, more toward ultramarine as it goes toward closer to the zenith and like I said it gets more uh, lighter and uh, more toward uh, you know a yellowish, greenish, sometimes magenta-ish color as, oh, we got a bug there, stuck. Let's see if I can save the bug. Don't know if he'll make it, but I got him off and flung him down, so. But anyway, um, I'm not sure how much of this the camera is picking up, but as I put these uh, lighter, warmer tones closer to the barn, it starts to give the sky more of a feeling that it's an open space and not some flat wall of color. And there's a lot of vibration going on. You don't even notice it unless you're really looking. But when you when you stare at the sky, if you pay really close attention, you'll see this subtle vibration of just tons of different colors of uh, blue and magenta and everything, There's, it's actually some an optical effect that our eyes play on us, but that's the way human beings see, and it's kind of what the Impressionists were after, was that vibration of color. And so if you um, paint your sky with, you know, not just one flat color, but you have some of these broken color effect in here, it can kind of mimic that and just give the viewer a sense of reality that they would not have otherwise. You can see too, when I got this sky in, it made this white here make sense. Before it was kind of fighting with the white up here, but now you know, it makes a lot more sense. Okay, while they have, while I have this on my palette, I'm going to clean off really good my small brush that I was using before. I'm going to uh, shape this thing. It kind of looks funny how crooked the silo is. I, I made it a little more crooked than it is in real life. And it looks like I made the roof a little bit, uh, for this thing, a little bigger than it is in real life. We have some uh, clouds coming over. Perfect time to do drawing adjustments.
Oh boy, I just flung a whole bunch of white on my shoe. <laughs> I'll wipe that off or I'll get in my car. I have white paint everywhere. So th this silo is definitely not drawn perfectly how it is in life, but it's not that big of a deal. It's I have it leaning a little more, and it's a little skinnier than what it is in life. But as I can't emphasize this enough, you know, accurate, precise drawing is not the main objective when you're plein air painting. Colors and values are. The photograph can give you the drawing, unless of course you're shooting with a wide angle lens and you're distorting everything. But the photograph will not give you good color and value. Not like your eye can. So the drawing of this thing is going to have to suffer a bit. And if you uh, are like I used to be, and still am at times, and you find yourself just obsessing over drawing when you're out plein air painting, you just can't, you know, break yourself of that habit of, oh, it's got to be rendered perfectly in shape, um, then leave your paint or leave your brushes at home, and I challenge you to just go out and do the whole thing with just a palette knife. That will, uh, that limitation will break you of that habit pretty fast. And I think I said this before, when I want to paint really fast, I kind of almost ditch my brushes completely and just use a palette knife for that reason, because that alone just basically gets me out of that mindset of, oh, I have to draw it perfectly. And I will use the palette knife for foliage, and I use it for skies too, as you can see here. And sometimes I'll do this too, I'll just purposely kind of mess up the edges a bit. Kind of an artistic thing. I'm using a uh, soft imitation badger hairbrush to do this. If you do want to be completely obsessive about your drawing, a badger hairbrush is the way to go. They're very good at precise drawing.
Uh, if you have questions too about you know my painting materials or anything that you know, I didn't that you don't quite understand what I mentioned, you know, feel free to comment below. I won't give an all-out art lesson in the comment section, um, but I will, uh, you know, help in whatever way I can. Give some advice and everything. We've lost our sunlight again. Thankfully, a lot of this is done, but I would like to have a little more sunlight. darker a little more ultramarine at the top of the sky the paints pretty thick so even though I mix it a little darker here blending it in to the uh, into this heavier mix around here it'll lighten it up That right there really helped make this painting. Some of this gets a little tricky. I do want to try to get this in somewhat precise because these little things can really make the painting. that off really good and fix that. Take a badger hair brush. Not quite done yet, but if you've come this far with me, I want to thank you for watching. Um, this is a bit of a longer painting. So if you come this far, you're a diehard, or else you just fast forwarded to the end, or toward the end, see how it turned out. Which is fine.
If you did fast forward to the end, though, you you missed some of the stuff I said, some of the advice I gave, but that's totally up to you. I thank you either way for watching. And we're still not quite at the end yet. It's hoping to get this painting done faster. It's hoping to maybe do two paintings today, but I don't think that's going to happen. Just going with some thick, dark paint. Getting that window in there. There's another window over here. Should have probably used a bigger brush for this window. How you doing? I'm doing good. We're going to stop the outdoor. Cool. Yeah. Pretty nice. Oh, thanks. Good job. On the home run stretch. Uh, oh, good luck. Thank you. I think that was my first official visitor of the day. Okay, now that I have this uh, locked in this window and comparing the cinder block to it, I'm just seeing a little more green in that cinder block that I want to get in. Just a slight greenish tone in spots. So I'm mixing, I like the value of my center block. I just want to get a couple of these subtle color shifts in. They seem a bit tedious, but that's why I'm out here. I never get that from a camera. I was going to say too, in my uh, classes, my online classes that I teach, a lot of my paintings, not all of them, but a lot of my paintings come that we do in the class come from plein air studies that I've done. And then sometimes we just go right off a photograph because I paint, I paint straight from photos too at times. Doing this though really helps me to identify the problems that photographs have. And they do have problems even when you shoot in raw. Biggest problem is just you haven't experienced it yet. You're experiencing reality from a machine when you paint just from photos and you never paint from life. And there's always just this, for me anyway, just this sense of doubt like, you know, is it really like that? Or so that's why I love. My, my preferred way of working is if I can get a um, a field study and a photograph, a really good photo, and then work off both of them. I 
That's a little too much there. Okay, last but not least, we're going to finish up the foreground. We blocked the foreground in at the beginning very quickly in approximate tone just to give us something to gauge off of. But, um, and it is somewhat changing. It is getting a little richer in color because the sun's getting a little bit lower in the sky. And when that happens, you know, your foreground tends to, uh, to get a little warmer, your grasses. But I think um, it's not that far off. I think we're gonna be okay. It's a little too yellow in there, a little too rich. So I'm just gonna go over that with some titanium white. Just to knock that down a bit. Now they just cut the hay in this field. So quite a bit of this is, um, is not you know, some of this foreground stuff that's knocked down is actually uh, just the same stuff that's still standing up but it's causing because it's laying down horizontally and it's not a vertical upright it's picking up more cool um, light from the Sun it's ref not cool light from the Sun but it's reflecting it has these highlight reflections on it which are coming off cool and making that area look a little cooler. And I'm just gonna paint it like that because I think it looks nice. It's a nice shadow in here. The shadow has shifted but I know it was over here before, so I'm just gonna put it in approximately where I thought it was. And this is a uh, wall of grass here that we're running into. And it just gets a little darker toward the bottom. seeing all kinds of color in here. See magentas in this grass. 
greens, yellows. Almost even looks like hint of, hints of blue at times. Now if you stick around here to the end, um, you'll see the uh, completed painting and also some other videos I have. So go check those out. A lot of uh, instruction. Sometimes I even say something funny or stupid. Try not to take myself too seriously though. I do sometimes make that mistake. So if you do this, um, also make sure that, you know, speaking of taking yourself too seriously, um, you know, look at, look at everything as a learning experience. Don't, um, I used to get so frustrated when my paintings wouldn't turn out. And, it's a journey. I kind of wish I could go back to those days when I royally sucked. There was something fun about those days. I'm running out of green, so I'm going to make some green. Ultramarine blue, cat yellow light. Throw in a bit of a lizard. Touch of white, maybe a little more blue. Has some wind picking up here. This is interesting. One more thing I did not see before. It's this shadow area. Right in here.
this point I'm just uh, doing some random designing in the grass sticking more compositionally without, um, without trying to wreck the, uh, the overall feel of the scene and notice I'm using the palette knife it's just something I feel freer with Oops, that was a little too much there. Okay, I think I'm gonna call that a painting. Thanks for watching.